In the annals of history, there are figures whose names echo through the ages. Yet behind every great figure lies a cast of characters whose stories often remain untold. Today, we invite you to step back in time and journey into the extraordinary life of one such individual. Meet Hans Bauer, aviator, confidant, and eyewitness to one of the darkest chapters in human history. As the personal pilot of Adolf Hitler, Bauer bore witness to the inner workings of the Third Reich, navigating the skies alongside one of the most notorious figures of the 20th century. Join us now for this extraordinary time witness account and immerse yourself in the untold stories that shape the course of history. Ladies and gentlemen, Today I will bring you excerpts from my 30 years of flying and a partial excerpt from the end of the Reich Chancellery, which I personally witnessed. I volunteered in 1915. They originally couldn't use me for flying. I was meant to be in the infantry. Then I wrote a letter to the German Kaiser asking him to help me. I had been in the Wehrkraft variant at the time. I was in the voluntary medical column. The Kaiser actually gave me the opportunity to come to Schleisheim. I then, like everyone else, I had done my recruit training and got out into the field after two months. I had been with the Bavarian Aviation Division, from where I then signed up to fly. I came home for a brief period of time and then rejoined the same division. I was an artillery and infantry pilot and had nine confirmed kills by the end of World War I. I only had to bring down one more aircraft to get the poor Le Marie cross. I could almost have cried when the war was over. We returned home to Firth, demobilized there, and immediately afterwards, the first so-called military airmail was established. That was during the Weimar constitutional period. We were authorized to fly the Rumpler C-1 aircraft. All of the other machines were destroyed, but they had 10 aircraft left for us. And we flew the route from Munich via Firth to Weimar. Nuremberg didn't have an airport back then, but it didn't take long before the whole council government thing started in Munich. And then the new council government was also proclaimed in Firth. Our commander told us we had to leave for Munich tomorrow to get money. The council was also declared here in Firth, and we needed money to pay off the soldiers. Then we said, we won't fly for you Reds. He countered, you will be dismissed immediately. And by the way, we still have bombs here. Nuremberg had been white at the time. We'll bomb the general command in Nuremberg tomorrow, he said. So that evening, I cycled to Nuremberg to the general command and told them what was in store for them. They were terrified and asked if it was possible to disable the plane somehow. I said, I'll try, but I don't know if I'll succeed because I don't know who's on guard duty. I will have to get into the hangar to get to the machines. Luckily, I had a junior officer on guard duty who used to be my mechanic, and he immediately agreed. We then took a steel torch and went into the hall and rendered the engines of all the machines unusable. We mainly worked on the so-called intake pipes. These were gasoline engines. They were wrapped in a layer of felt and we punched holes in them. The engine would still run, but it did not get the high speed to be able to fly. And then we prepared a plane for ourselves that we intended to take off with in the morning. It took us the whole night to set everything up, and when the first soldiers came out in the morning, we pushed open the hangar door, accelerated, and flew off to Bamberg. Bamberg was the seat of government at the time. I reported over there, and they were absolutely delighted that I was there, because they didn't have any machines. They said it would be extremely important that we dropped off couriers and newspapers over Munich. I then flew from Munich to Bamberg several times a day dropped off newspapers and couriers in the Munich area. The Reds from the Milnhaus were constantly shooting at the planes. We only flew 200 to 300 meters over the city, over the train station. There were machine gun nests set up there. I thought to myself, at some point they'll get you, better take your bike with you. 
From then on, I took my bike, tied it up to my aircraft. I took off the front panel, then we put the handlebars in. The wheels were tied to the cables, and that's how we flew to Munich every day. I actually got a few hits in the engine. All the dirt, hot water, and oil was splashed in my face, and my propeller stopped. I was just over the train terminal, so I glided out to where the forest cemetery is today. There weren't any houses there yet. Then I landed quite normally. So I took my bike and cycled to Ingolstadt. From there, I managed to get a flight to Bamberg. And a man called Schneckenhorst, who was the Reich's minister of war at the time, gave me a very warm welcome and even promised me a reward of 1,000 German marks. But I never got them. We flew every day. The whole incident in Firth only lasted three days. They didn't get any money because nobody made it to Munich to collect it. The soldiers had to be paid, so they couldn't pay the soldiers because they had no money. Then the soldiers started to revolt. This mess actually only lasted three days. I had then been in the so-called Freikorps app until the events in Munich came to an end and then joined the Bavarian Airmen in 1922. We flew the Munich Constance route back then. A year later, the route to Vienna was opened. We flew a Junkers F-13, a five-seater aircraft. A very beautiful aircraft. It was small but beautiful. But the engines were bad. The war engines we had at the time didn't really meet the requirements of a machine of this type because it was so heavy. When we took off, I was constantly looking for emergency landing sites. In the event of an aircraft failure, I always wanted to have an emergency landing site in mind. I wanted to get to the next field to land and not crash the plane. But we had enough spare engines after the war was over in Bavaria. We stuffed all the fire stations full with engines to keep them away from the ATARD so they couldn't destroy them. We had enough engines, but the fuselages were scarce. We then expanded the route to Geneva. I then flew the route from Geneva, Zurich, Munich, and Vienna for years. Then in 1928, the route was open to Milan. I made the first official mail flight to Milan, then the first official mail flight to Rome. That was in 1929. At the time, I was awarded the Corona d'Italia medal from the King of Italy with the title of a Cavalier. I flew this route for many years. When I landed in Munich one day coming from Rome, I was asked to drive to the Brown House to see Mr. Hitler, who wanted to rent a plane. Back then, anyone who had the necessary small change could hire an airplane just like a cab. And that's how I came into contact with Hitler for the first time in my life. So I went there. Hess was sitting in the anteroom. I knew him well because Hess was an accomplished sports pilot. I had spent quite some time with him in the past. Hitler received me very nicely and told me the following. Mr. Bauer, my advisors have recommended something to me. Quite a number of them have already flown with you. Mr. Brunning, my opponent, has the radio at his disposal, and I have nothing but the car and the train, so I can attend one, or, in the best case, two election meetings in one evening. And my advisors have told me that it might be possible to attend four or five meetings in an evening if I were to fly. Would that be possible? I said it is certainly possible, provided, of course, there are landing strips. Hitler said, Will Mr. Bauer please get in touch with my adjutant Bruckner, work out a route, specifically 65 meetings within eight days. So five meetings every day. Then we'll try and see how this works. And by the way, I have to tell you the following. I have absolutely no confidence in your flying. I said, why, Mr. Hitler? I've flown once in my life and I swore to myself never again. And so he told me that he flew with Captain Grime, who at the time had a flying school in Würzburg. In 1920, they flew from Würzburg to Berlin in an old warplane, the Rumpler C-1, as I mentioned earlier. 
He wanted to fly to Berlin to save the Kapkuppe. The weather conditions were very bad. Graham got lost and didn't even find Berlin. He then landed near Uterbuch, and Hitler afterwards said, I've puked out everything I had in me, not once, but ten times. And so they ended up in Juderbog, and luckily he had two identity cards with him. They didn't really know what was going on back then. Is the airfield red, or is the airfield white? When he saw that the soldiers were walking around with red armbands, he pulled out his red ID, asked for petrol, got petrol, then flew on to Berlin, and when he arrived in Berlin in the evening, the cap putsch was already over. And he swore to himself never again. And he told me, so you know, Mr. Bauer, it looks bad if I always have to throw up before my own speeches. I said, my Fuhrer, you don't look like that at all. I've flown thousands of people in the meantime and have a certain eye for it. I can usually tell in advance whether one of the passengers has an intolerance to flying, depending on the weather conditions, of course. Back then, we had the three-engined Rohrbach plane. I said, my Fuhrer, I'll take you to the front into the cockpit where the engineer normally sits. You have a bit of a distraction there? Firstly, the whole instrument panel is there. The controls are there. It's a literal glass box. You can look down vertically. You can look up. You can look forward. There's movement, and the instruments and so on are all in motion. And I've always repeatedly had people who would get sick go to me in the front, and no one has ever gotten sick there. And so the first two or three flights, I had him in the front with me. Then he said, no, no, I'll stay in the back. I can still remember it well. When we started, we flew from Munich to Dresden. He spoke in Dresden, then to Leipzig. In Leipzig, he spoke in the exhibition hall. Then from Leipzig to Zwickau, from Zwickau to Chemnitz, and then from there to Plauen. We finished in the evening. That was five gatherings in one day. And he was very satisfied. It always looked like a morgue in our machine. We got so many flowers, which of course had to be put in the luggage compartment. It stank like a morgue in there, and when we landed in Plauen, Hitler gave me the most beautiful rose bouquet, at least 100 roses, and said that I had done an excellent job, and he just wanted it to go on like this. And it did go on like that. We were able to fly through the whole campaign. There were three election rounds in 1932, and 187 meetings were scheduled. All 187 meetings were able to take place. In all weather conditions, which were unpredictable at the time, not a single meeting was canceled. Whether it was fog, hail, or other bad weather, storms, or else, he flew with us through everything. He once said, well, Mr. Barr, it's not going to happen today, is it? I then said, if you have the courage to fly, then we'll do it, but we're flying through a heavy hailstorm. We have to get through it. It won't get better. If you have the courage, then we'll do it. It sounds worse than it is when the hail hits the metal cabin. It sounds like a machine gun going off when you're in there. When we landed in Munich after the last election flight, Hitler said to me, Mr. Bauer, you have done such an excellent job, and I owe you a great, great deal. And if I come to power, I will set up a government squadron of which I want you to be the leader. And that's what happened. I was recruited as a major in the police force because there was no air force back then. So I became a police officer, although I know as much about policing as a policeman does about airplanes. Hitler once told me, power, my house is open to you at any time. You can come and go as you please. My first wife unfortunately died in the year 1935, and I got married again in 1936. And we spent a lot of time in Berlin. And if I wasn't there for dinner with Hitler one evening, Hitler would say the next day, tell me, Bauer, where were you yesterday? I don't want to hear that you're somehow flirting with Berlin girls. You are married. I don't want that. He looked after me like a father looks after his son. But then came the war, and the first place we were stationed for three years was Rustenburg, 
East Prussia. And from there, we flew to Russia, depending on the situation and so on. And wherever the situation was dicey, Hitler flew with us. The briefings were typically at noon and at 12 o'clock at night. And if the briefing revealed that there was an especially sensitive situation, then the Fuhrer took off at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning for the Ukraine or wherever else we needed to go. On March 13, 1943, when things were already going backwards, the following happened. We flew to Smolensk that day. Field Marshal Klug was based there. I often had to bring Klug to Hitler. He often said to me to get Klug and bring him here. And so we flew to Smolensk again one day on March 13, 1943. And normally Hitler discussed the situation with Klug while we had our lunch in the mess hall. We then took off again in the late afternoon. And when I came out to the plane, General von Tresco had already been there at the plane before me. I was at the plane roughly an hour before takeoff. He nervously walked around the machine and looked concerned. I knew him pretty well because we repeatedly had lunch together in the mess hall. So he walked around the plane very nervous and I said, What's wrong? What's the matter? Is the situation really that bad? But I hardly got an answer from him, and my guilty feelings were kind of bad. But the following turned out to be the case. There was an attempted assassination on the plane that day. I didn't know about the whole thing myself. I only found out many years later, when the resistance fighters published a book, Officers Against Hitler. It contained the whole story of how everything went down. And when I read that, it immediately dawned on me why Treskow was dancing around the machine like a wild animal. They had worked out the following. At the table, Treskow said to Professor Brandt, who always accompanied the Fuhrer and was there at lunch, Mr. Brandt, could you take two bottles of cognac to General Steve for me? General Steve was with us at the Rastenburg complex at the time. Brandt said, of course, unsuspectingly, yes, yes, of course we can do that. Treskow said, I have two bottles, very good stuff, excellent bottles of cognac. I'd like to give that to General Steve. Now the following was planned. They prepared a bomb with the same English explosives that were used a year later on the July 20th attack, but in a modified version for blowing up our airplane. They put together a package that looked like two bottles of cognac in their original packaging. It was a judge, Mr. Slabrendorf, who prepared and planned out everything. Treskow was outside next to plane before takeoff, so he waited until the Fuhrer arrived. The Fuhrer boarded the plane, then the other people arrived. We were about 25 passengers in all. When Brandt boarded the plane, Slabrendorf handed over the package in Treskow's name and Brandt put it in the luggage net at the back, off the plane. We always had accompanying machines with us. The assassins were counting on the fact that when we reached the area of Minsk after half an hour or three quarters of an hour, the escort plane would report that the Fuhrer's plane had crashed. But the message didn't come. Instead, we landed normally in Rastenburg two hours later. Now, of course, the assassins are terrified. If the package was found and opened and it turned out that there was no cognac inside, just explosives and stuff, then heads would roll. Slabrendorf immediately got into a Ju-52 and flew towards Rastenburg. Once there, he immediately went to Professor Brandt, who had just been in his room and said, Professor, have you handed the package over to General Steve yet? He said, no, the parcel is still there on the table. So Brandt basically took it and kept it in his room until he had a chance to meet Steve. Then Slabrendorf said, Mr. Brand, we've got a new cognac that's even better than the one we gave you. And so on and so forth. Why don't you give me the old package and then hand over the new one? 
Brandt then handed over the package, took the new package and gave it to Steve. And once home, the assassins opened the package and found that practically everything was in order. The wire had been eaten away. The firing pin had hit the primer, but nothing had ignited. So we were lucky again, as the Fuhrer usually was. With all these stories, he always got away with a blue eye. Then on December 22, 1944, we left Rastenburg and moved to Berlin, to the Reich Chancellery. The leaders wanted the Fuhrer to take up residence in Sosen, where the high command was located. But he refused and moved to the Reich Chancellery. And so the briefings were, of course, always held in the Reich Chancellery. The newspaper later reported that Hitler had a mental crash, but that was all nonsense, of course. On the contrary, we often admired him when reports came in. Bad reports, of which we knew that he had ordered the exact opposite. Then he would scream terribly, of course he did. And then he would put his hands behind his back, walk up and down the room 10 or 15 times, and suddenly this convulsive state would subside and he would approach us again as normal, continuing to speak normal. Of course, you can't be surprised that his health was pretty bad by then. You must remember that the war lasted not one, but six years at that time. Hitler never slept more than three hours a night. Normally, the briefing occurred at noon and at 12 o'clock at night. The briefing usually lasted until 4, 5, or 6 o'clock in the morning. And then Hitler had a so-called tea hour after the briefing, mostly because he felt the need to recover from the day's events of the war. During the tea hour, if there were any guests in the complex, soldiers who came to get their Knights Cross or something, or ministers or people from the party, who were there on a visit or for a lecture. They were his guests for the tea hour. They had a cup of coffee down there and a few cookies to eat. And they were only allowed to talk about the past or the future and not about the war. Hitler wanted to tear himself away from the events of the day. And if no one was there, the house servants would come to me and say, General Bauer, you have to come to tea hour tonight. I said, friends, please spare me the tea hour. I was always together with the Fuhrer anyway. Please spare me the tea hour. I had so many soldiers and pilots under me and was responsible for the whole aviation department. I had over 40 aircraft and crews under me at the time, a lot of people. And I was responsible for the whole operation. And at 8 a.m. I have to be out at the airfield again. If I've only slept for two hours at night, then I'm only half a man for the day. The Fuhrer got through that ordeal for six years. It's no wonder he wasn't in such good shape. I still remember when Dr. Morell joined us back then. That was in 1935 when the Fuhrer was constantly suffering from dizzy spells. Hitler once said to us, I was there in the innermost circle. I was at home with him, so to speak. He said, I must have cancer in my stomach and I can't help myself, I'm going to die soon. Hoffman, that was our photographer, was a very heavy drinker. He never went to bed without a couple of drinks, and he had a severe case of kidney disease and liver problems, and was in a hospital in Berlin for weeks. Hoffman wasn't just a photographer, he was an artist by profession, a painter. He could draw fantastically, that man. And he was always in contact with all the state actors and all these people. But Hoffman was healthy again after a very short time, and Hoffman said to Hitler, My Fuhrer, why don't you get yourself checked out by this man? He meant Dr. Morell. Dr. Morell had his office on Kurfürstendamm. He didn't treat normal health insurance patients, only private patients. You couldn't get treated by him for less than 50 marks. And 50 marks was a lot of money back then. 
Dr. Morell had once been a ship's doctor and was also a qualified chemist. He had also studied the traditional medicines that were available in India, and then he mixed them with Western drugs and made his own medicine. And then one day he came to the Fuhrer. I was there myself. The Fuhrer had been a pure vegetarian. He usually ate two hard-boiled eggs with a green salad for lunch for weeks. That was his whole meal. And then Dr. Morell came, and there were five or six glasses, small glasses of water, at the Fuhrer's table, in all colors. There was green water, there was yellowish water, there was light-colored water, there was blue water. The doctors advised him to drink one of the glasses with every bite of food. There were always new doctors. Dr. Brandt himself was only a surgeon. Hitler always called in all the doctors from the various clinics to find out what was wrong with him. Each one gave him a different diagnosis, but anyways, he had to drink the different waters with medicine. Then Morell came, saw these glasses on the table and asked the Fuhrer what they were. And he asked if he could have the documents of the other doctors. He took them with him, took a urine and stool sample from him and came back two days later. Then Morell said, My Fuhrer, you have menthol poisoning from the different medications the various doctors gave you. Hence these dizzy spells. Besides, you have very little to no intestinal bacteria, which are vital for digestion. I'm going to give you mother flora and something else so that you get a better intestinal flora and your digestion works as it should again. Then about four weeks later, I was sitting at the table with Hitler. The Fuhrer said that Morell was a good man. When we were among ourselves, he also spoke Bavarian like all of us, so everything was in dialect. He said that Morell was a great bloke and today I could eat hobnails again. Everything tastes good and I don't have dizzy spells or anything else. And from that hour on, from that day on, Morell couldn't be taken away. The whole leadership team had all their treatments done by Morell. We had four or five doctors there too, but if something was wrong, we all went to Morell. We knew that with Morell, things would get better relatively quickly. And so that's how it was regarding Hitler's state of health. I think it was all due to his troubled life, and above all, because of July 20th. This assassination story back then dealt him a huge blow. He never believed that any of his own officers were trying to kill him, and people keep asking, why didn't Stauffenberg just shoot Hitler? It is said that an officer who was allowed to see Hitler had to hand over his pistol. But that's not true. It's not true at all. The pistols only had to be handed in after the assassination attempt. After the attack, the luggage, handbags, etc. were checked at the entrance, and the officers were asked if they had a pistol with them, to leave it here and they could take it back with them afterwards. Now it was also the case that Hitler had completely withdrawn from any avoidable interpersonal contact in the last year. And why? Well, we had traitors in our own ranks at the time. We don't know who, not even today. It turned out that when the Fuhrer went for a walk in the Reich Chancellery Garden with an officer or a guest, two or three hours later, the Fuhrer's conversation was broadcast on English radio. So everything was leaked to the outside world, and the problem was that Hitler always spoke openly with people who were close to him. For example, when a soldier came to get his medals or something, he was also a guest of the Fuhrer. So he sat at the table, and since Hitler used to speak freely in close surroundings without paying attention to what he said, and that's why many conversations became public. And these conversations were leaked to the English, and so Hitler said to himself, I can't trust anyone anymore. So he retreated to his wooden hut and lived there until the end, as long as we were out in Rastenburg. That was terribly sad for us. Then we also had a movie theater in our facility. After all, the facility was occupied by about 2,000 men. 
It was a small theater for about 50 people. Every Tuesday we showed the newsreel, which was also shown in other cinemas all over the country. It usually came out on Friday and was personally censored by the Fuhrer on Tuesday. Always in the presence of Mr. Jodel or Mr. Keitel, it was mainly military events that were shown. But it was also the case that we received the English newsreels. And why was that? We still had the Lufthansa airline flying to Spain at the time. In Spain, the English, Americans, French, and so on were all there. Spain was a neutral country and things were exchanged there. They got the German newsreels and newspapers from us and we got theirs in exchange. Only when we moved into the Reich Chancellery, the water and electricity, etc., were cut off shortly afterwards. We had a small diesel generator down there with 60 kilowatts of power. The diesel generator ensured that we had running water and light. Mr. Henschel, who was the mechanic in charge at the time, said that we had fuel for a maximum of four more weeks. So we would have lasted approximately four more weeks in the bunker, and then it would have gone dark for good. Hitler had also never consumed alcohol. Hitler had also never consumed alcohol. I know a story about Gauleiter Berkel, a man from Falses. He came to us one fine day and said, My Fuhrer, you should have a good glass of wine. Then the Fuhrer said, Get away from me with your sour pusses. Berkel countered, My Fuhrer, don't say that. I'll bring you a wine you'll be really happy with and not say it's sour. A wine that is not sweetened, but naturally sweet with which you will be satisfied. Then a few days later, Burgel arrives with 20 bottles of wine. Of course, you can imagine that he didn't pick the worst ones. So glasses were set out, the wine was poured, and then Birkel said, my Führer, try it. And Hitler took a quick sip, stirred it around with his tongue and said, it's not bad. Then Birkel said, my Führer, why don't you drink it? No, no, I don't drink alcohol. Because there was alcohol in it, he didn't drink it. Then on April 15th, I went for a walk with the Führer in the Reich Chancellery Garden. The Führer said he wanted to see the defenses. The courtyard wall was breached, pack guns were installed, mine launchers were set up, and even a small gun turret was at the Führer bunker exit. When I went for that walk with the Führer, who was all alone with me, Mrs. Goebbels suddenly came from the Tiergarten side where our vehicles were parked. When Hitler saw the woman, he immediately ran up to her and said, For God's sake, madam, you're still in Berlin. I'll put my driver at your disposal right away, and he'll take you up to the Berghof. Berlin is just a mouse trap for you. I want you to leave Berlin as quickly as possible. I stood next to her and Mrs. Goebbels said the following. My Führer, I have a big request. My husband is district leader of Berlin. Should the Russians really enter Berlin, my husband will fall with Berlin. For me, continuing life without my husband is completely pointless and futile. I didn't give birth to my children so that they could later be shown around in the Soviet Union or America. We don't yet know what fate has reserved for us today, and I would like to ask if I can take up residence with my husband. And so the wife moved in that day with her six children. They didn't have any beds or anything else, but somehow they made it work. We just felt terribly sorry for the woman in the last few days. We were sitting together in a small group on April 28th, two days before everything ended, and Mrs. Goebbels said, Unfortunately, I didn't have much of a life. He only went to events when my husband forced me to. My friends, who were all slightly envious of me, 
would at most say, look after this one or that one. Her husband seems to have a relationship with her. As you know, I have six children with my husband. I've experienced a lot of things that my husband did wrong, but it's forgiven. But I would really change my life if I could get out of here again. On April 25th, Hitler told me, Bauer, drive out to Gatow Airport. General Miller will accompany you. He is responsible for the defense of the airfield. He should try to keep the people together so that we can maintain contact with the outside world for as long as possible. It was also the case that at the end, on April 22nd, the Russians had already occupied Tempelhof. I had flown all my planes over to Gatow. I still had nine four-engine Condor planes over there. I also went in to see Colonel Butcher, who was in charge of defending the place. He said to me, Bauer, I've been at this airfield for 10 years now. He used to be a civilian director there and later joined the Air Force, of course. I won't survive if the Russians take the place. I'm so sworn to the Fuhrer, I won't survive it. He committed suicide shortly afterwards. There were less than 20 men left from the Luftwaffe itself. There was no question of defending the airfield under these circumstances. I then told my men, Try to fly out of here during the night. I'll drive back into the Fuhrer and stay with him. You don't have to wait for me or show any consideration. I'm not coming back. Try to fly out. They flew out the same night, unfortunately. One plane was shot down. They flew to Reckland, a small airfield 100 kilometers north of Berlin. It was the biggest test airfield we had at the time. They were shot down on the way. So I drove back to, to the Führer in Berlin and told him, oh, my Führer, I'm afraid I have to report that there's no chance of defending the field. Your own machine is in the hangar already shot to pieces by the tanks, and I have given orders for the soldiers to try to fly out from here to Recklin at night. He said, ah, Bauer, you did the right thing. Fly away, I don't need you anymore. You're an aviator. They said, my Fuhrer, that's not what I meant. I want to stay with you. He said, no, Bowers, I have no use for you at all. Fly away, you're an airman. Then I said, my Fuhrer, take a look around. You can't get five of your loyal followers together anymore. None of those you once thought you couldn't live without is here anymore. I'm not one of those people who abandon you in your hour of need. Let me stay here. And he said, if that's how you feel, stay there. I stayed, as did my comrade Beats, who served with me. The last time when we flew with Hitler, he was with me. We had two pilots on the Führer's plane, because Göring said that if something happened, we needed a second pilot. Normally, we only flew with one pilot. The other had been the engineer, and the third was the radio operator. Anyways, Beat said, no, I'll stay here too. If you stay here, I'll stay here too. So he stayed there too, but fell later when he got a headshot after we had went out of the bunker. On April 28th, the Führer called me again. He said, Bauer, I'm sending Colonel von Below to Wenck's group today, and you can still march out. I then said, my Führer, I have already asked you once to leave me here. I have my hands full at the moment, and I'm extremely busy. We have at that time started to expand the so-called east-west axis, a landing strip in the middle of Berlin. We have extended the road from the Brandenburg Gate via Friedensengelfick to the Tiergarten Bridge, the Ostweststrasse, which has a width of 64 meters, and turned it into a temporary runway. The lampposts were knocked down and the curbs were filled with sand to prevent the machines from hitting the curbs. And I was involved with that at the time. The Air Force actually carried it out. But I was assigned as a consultant. And I told the soldiers that, of course, it wouldn't work the way they did it. Junker 52 machines have to land there at night without lights. We have to cut down at least 20 or 30 more meters of the trees in the tier garden. Because if you think about it, the road was 64 meters wide, and a Ju-52 had a wingspan of 30 meters. And if it swerved a little to the left or right when flying in at night, it would get stuck in the trees. 
That happened to one plane anyway. Quite a few planes landed normally, and one actually got stuck in the trees. I actually wanted to protect the trees of Tiergarten because it used to be the lung of Berlin. But later, after the war, it turned out that not a single tree was left standing because the poor Berliners needed the wood. I was just underneath the Friedensengel when suddenly a Fiesler Stork machine buzzed above me. I thought to myself, what's that Storch doing here? It flew towards the Brandenburg Gate and landed right in front of it. Now the Russians have been firing constantly. They fired at the Brandenburg Gate with at least two grenade launchers. When I drove past there in my car in the morning, a grenade hit right in front of me. My driver lost one finger in the attack, but fortunately I was unhurt. The Fiesler Storch flew straight towards the Brandenburg Gate as the Russian gunfire increased again. It flew in the trees on the right and crashed. I immediately jumped into my car and drove there, but there was no one there except two soldiers. I asked the soldiers if they knew who was on the plane. They told me that it must have been a woman and a high-ranking officer who was badly wounded. Where are they? I asked. He replied that the two of them had driven in a car in the direction of the Reich Chancellery. I immediately drove to the Reich Chancellery and learned there that it had been Hanna Reich and Colonel General Grime who had flown in. I've known Ritter von Grime since the First World War when we were together. He had just been undergoing medical treatment because he had been shot through the leg. The two of them stayed there for about three days and then flew out again. I spoke to Grime, and he told me the following. Bauer, I was recently appointed field marshal, and a German field marshal does not go into captivity. I will probably not keep this rank for long. The war is now coming to an end. Hitler informed me of the overall situation and his actions, and I have to say that I wouldn't have acted any differently in his place. As is well known, Grime committed suicide after the war and is now buried in Salzburg. Then there was the story about the wedding of Hitler and Ms. Brown. It belonged to the inner circle, but I knew nothing about the wedding. Only Bormann and von Below were there, and three or four other people who attended the wedding. I only found out about the wedding when I said goodbye to him. He said, Bauer, I have two more jobs for you. Firstly, I hold you personally responsible for the burning of my wife and myself. Secondly, see if you can fly with Bormann to Donitz in northern Germany. Only then did I know that he had married. There were actually other weddings down there in the bunker of SS men. Three or four SS men really wanted to get married before everything came to an end. State Secretary Naumann was the registrar at the time. It all took place upstairs in the anteroom while the grenades were exploding outside. It really was a warlike wedding. A few rooms were made available downstairs for the men who had got married so that they could at least sleep with their wives for one more night. Then came April 30th. I was called to see Hitler as I had been before. The ordinance told me to bring Colonel Beetz with me. Until then, he had never called Colonel Beetz. So I ran over to the Führerbunker. We were living in the new Reich Chancellery at the time. I was in the same room as Bormann. It was about a hundred yards to the Führerbunker. The access tunnel was already badly perforated by the artillery fire. We ran over to the Führerbunker. I knocked on Hitler's door and he ran straight up to me, grabbed my hands and said, Bauer, I want to say goodbye to you. I replied, for God's sake, my Führer, you don't want to put an end to all this, do you? He said, my generals and officers have betrayed and abandoned me. My soldiers no longer want to, and I simply can't do it anymore. Back then, we had a six-engine plane, the Ju-390, which could hold 8,000 gallons of fuel and had a range of almost 4,000 miles. I can take it wherever you want, I said. I can take it to Argentina or Japan. 
I can take it to some sheikh in the Sahara Desert. I've been to Egypt many times. I know my way around over there. Nobody will find you. So he said, Bauer, leaving Germany is completely out of the question for me. I would probably have two options. I could drive from here to Obersalzburg or go to Donitz in Flensburg. But then 14 days later, I would be just as far as I am here today. The war is now coming to an end and you have to have the courage to draw the consequences. And I'm ending everything here. I just fear that the Russians will shoot with gas. We probably have gas locks installed here, but who trusts them? Personally, I don't, Hitler said. During the war, we created a gas that stunned people for 24 hours. We were able to find out through our intelligence service that the Russians had the same gas. It would be unimaginable if the Russians were to get their hands on Hitler alive. He himself said they would lock me in an iron cage and put me on display all over the world. I can spare myself that. Then he looked around the room, it was a small room, and in front of him on the wall hung a picture. Alter Fritz painted by Anton Graf, an old painting I remember when he bought it in 1934. He said, Bar, look at this painting here. It was the dearest thing I've ever owned in my life. It has great historical value. And I would also like this picture to be preserved for later generations. I would like to bequeath this painting to you as a gift in gratitude for your faithful service. I replied that I would be very happy to take the painting and that I would later give it to a gallery or museum so that it would be available to the public, he said. Bohr, you shouldn't do that. It's enough if you keep the painting in your own hands. And then he said, among other things, Bauer, I have two more orders for you. First, I hold you personally responsible for the burning of me and my wife. And the second is, please try your best to somehow get Bormann up to Donitz. Donitz will be my natural successor. And I have given Bormann a number of verbal and written orders for him. I said to him, my Führer, I'll do my best. Then we said goodbye. That took about 20 minutes. Then he said goodbye to Beats. And when I was already outside the door, he followed me again, grabbed me by both hands, thanked me again and said, they should write on my gravestone that I have become the victim of my generals. I said to him, mein Führer, you mustn't say that. He said, Bauer, there's a lot you don't know. As everybody knew, we had a very high level of secrecy here. It was incredible. Everybody had his own area of responsibility, and the others knew very little about it. I can tell you this from my own experience. I was stationed with my offices outside the airport. And when I went from the Führer's headquarters to my casino at the airport, my people asked me, Colonel, you've just been to see the Führer. What's new? Just at that moment, a special message came in. It was less than 10 minutes ago that I was standing next to Admiral Putkammer in the Führer's headquarters, and he didn't make a peep that a special announcement was about to be sent. Let's assume that a special report would come out that 25,000 tons had been sunk. We could have talked about it. Such news is not subject to the highest level of secrecy. But nevertheless, nothing was talked about. But that's how it was in the inner circle of management. So I left the bunker and got in touch with Bormann. General Bergdorf, the Führer's chief adjutant, joined me. He said to me, Hans, you have to do me a favor. What? Did I ask? He said, Bauer, you have to shoot me. I replied, for God's sake, I don't want to be cursed by your wife and your four children. He said, I was Hitler's chief adjutant. I can't take the risk of falling into the hands of the Russians. It was similar with Ambassador Huell. He was the middleman between Ribbentrop and the Fuhrer. I asked him if he would come with us. He said he would go with us, but if the Russians got too close, he would shoot himself. Later, when we tried to escape, we found shelter in an underground facility. Russian soldiers had already gathered in front of the complex, and when Huell heard them talking, he took out a picture of his wife and shot himself. 
So now back to the conversation with Borman. Mr. Reichsleiter, I said, I have orders to march out with you. Please decide when we march out of here. Shortly after saying goodbye to Hitler, I told Beetz that we had to go from the bunker over to our quarters in the Reich Chancellery to pack our things. We had to hurry because Hitler's suicide was imminent, and we wanted to escape with Bormann immediately afterwards. It took about an hour to pack everything. We left everything that was useless for the escape behind and then ran back to the Führer bunker. The way over to the Führer bunker, I ran through a long underground passageway, which was very desolate due to the heavy gunfire. When we arrived at the stairs leading into the Führer bunker, we could already smell cigarette smoke. Smoking was not allowed in Hitler's surroundings, so that was more than suspicious. We jumped down the stairs and right in front of me were Dr. Goebbels, Bormann, Rattenhuber, the head of the police, Miller, the head of the Gestapo, 10 to 12 SS men, all of them in a wild mess. I said, for God's sake, minister, is it over already? Yes, he said, it's all over. I asked if the Fuhrer was lying in his room and he replied, no, he's already upstairs being burned. I said, yes, but Mr. Minister, the Fuhrer gave me the order to take care of that. Goebbels then said that Hitler gave that order to everyone he said goodbye to personally, and that he personally initiated the burning in the presence of Bormann, Rattenhuber, and so on. Kempke, Hitler's personal driver, has organized the necessary fuel. Everything is in order, said Goebbels. Standing next to me was Rattenhuber, who had just come down from the burning and said that the cremation was in full swing. I didn't go back upstairs, which I later bitterly, bitterly regretted. You can't burn a person with gasoline and certainly not the way it happened that day. That day at three o'clock in the morning when the burning had taken place, a man from Rottenhuber's team came down to us. We were all sitting together at a small round table and reported, I obediently report that Hitler was almost completely burnt to death. We buried him in a bomb crater. When he made this report, we took a deep breath and said, thank God, it's all over now and there's nothing left of him. It later turned out that he had been almost completely preserved and that it was a complete false report. Rattenhuber himself had also spent 10 years in prison in Moscow. And when we were finally allowed to go home after 11 years, I asked him, Hans, who was the man who gave you the 100% false report back then? I don't know, he said. You know, I had a few hundred people under my command at the time. It was one of the young guys. I can't tell you his name anymore. It turned out later that the bodies were still very well preserved. They were just a bit charred. If I had gone upstairs and seen that, I would have gone back down immediately and told the minister that you can't burn a person like that. That's exactly what I told the Russians later, too. Kempke had had only 200 liters of petrol at his disposal for the cremation. The corpses were wrapped in blankets, then 20 liters of petrol were poured over each one, and so the corpses were simply stewed. They were lying on the ground, on the grass, so the necessary heat was not generated. The corpses were only charred and seared. The fingers and everything else was completely preserved. Through my profession, I have unfortunately seen many comrades crash. Even with several thousand liters of fuel, you still can't burn a person. The extremities separate from the body, but the head and torso remain in one piece. So you can't burn a person. You have to do it the way the Indians cremate their dead people. They take one or two cubic meters of wood and place a grate over it on which the dead are laid. The bodies then burn completely in this charcoal fire. We wouldn't have had charcoal fires back then, but we did have coal. We had at least 100 tons of coal in the Reich Chancellery. The entire facility was heated by six huge ovens. If I had seen how the cremation was carried out at the time, I would have gone down to the minister and told him that the Führer could not be cremated in this way. 
And so it happened that exactly one year later we were transported from Moscow to Berlin, again to explain the events of that time on site. The Russian commissioner came to me and said, Mr. Bauer, we have brought you here once again to take a look at Hitler's remains and to tell us whether you can identify any distinguishing features that might point to Hitler as a person. We now have to make a decision as to whether we can finally destroy Hitler's remains or whether we have to archive them. However, the bodies were not shown to us after all. We were about seven people from the former Reich Chancellery. They tried to play us off against each other by questioning us individually. About four weeks later, a Russian officer read us the protocol of the investigation and quoted the statement of Hitler's dentist, Dr. Blaschka, who recognized a denture as his work, and therefore the corpse was clearly Hitler's. And it can only be the person of Hitler. Unfortunately, they didn't show the bodies. Whether the Russians still have the bodies in their hands, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Let's go back to when I marched out of the Chancellery together with Bormann. The march out was postponed for 24 hours. And it was like this. We had about 600 wounded down there and quite a number of pretty nurses. They were all screaming for poison. They wanted poison to end their own lives so they wouldn't be raped by the Russians. We found out that in Weissensee and in military hospitals all the women were raped. Whether sick or terminally ill, old or young, it didn't matter. And when the nurses heard that, they just desperately wanted poison and ran to Goebbels. There was this famous poison pill that Hitler and Eva had used to kill themselves. And then they discussed whether it might not be better to prevent this kind of excess. Because even if the Russians saw someone in an SS uniform or recognized that it was an SS man, they would simply shoot them ruthlessly from behind. No ifs, ands, or buts. And so it was feared that if the Russians really took over the Reich Chancellery, they would shoot all the wounded and then rape the nurses, that there would be a terrible cleanup down there. To avoid that, Dr. Goebbels suggested something. It was out of the question for him anyway. He wanted to take his own life and that of his children. And that's what he did. But before he did, he discussed whether it wouldn't be a good idea to send a parliamentarian to the Russians. And so General Krebs, who could speak Russian, was sent over to the Russians at night. To Zhukov, who had set up his quarters at the Halish's gate at the time, he negotiated with them as to whether it would be possible to officially hand over the Reich Chancellery to the Russians, i.e. the senior officers, so that excesses of this kind could be avoided. Krebs came back an hour later and explained that he would have to go over again at six o'clock in the morning, that Zhukov couldn't decide that on his own, he would have to confer with Stalin first. And then he came back in the morning and Stalin rejected the proposal. Then Goebbels said that everyone had to see for themselves how they get out of here. And so I left with Bormann the next day, after the march out had been postponed for 24 hours. We got out of the Reiskenslei, into the subway shaft, and got as far as Weitendammer Bridge. And then it was over. The Russians were standing there. I sat Bormann down on a corner and said, Mr. Reichsleiter, wait here. I'll try to find a way through the Russian lines and then I'll come back. I came back an hour or an hour and a half later. He was still sitting there with a young dead Russian lying in front of him. I then led him into a house, which was full of wounded men and women. And when I heard shooting in the courtyard where we were, I jumped down the stairs and saw that there were at least 20 Russians at the back of the courtyard. I went down because there were only four of us left. That was Dr. Nauman, the state secretary of Goebbels, Dr. Stumpfecker, Bormann and me. We were still four men together. So the four of us decided to try to break through at all costs, no matter what happened to us. So we got out of the house. It was still dark. 
The Russians were in the houses to the left and right roaring and singing their songs, most of them drunk, celebrating May 1st. And they shot at everything that moved, at running shadows. The only one who got through was Dr. Nauman. He was one hell of a guy, he was the first to go. By the time the Russians realized that someone was running over there and they started shooting, he had already disappeared from sight. We who were running after them were hit. They shot both my legs, a chest shot, a hand shot. I was lying there. I couldn't move at all. Nothing. And that's how I ended up in captivity. During the escape attempt, Bauer was seriously wounded in both legs and was taken prisoner by the Soviets on May 2, 1945. In a military hospital in Poznan, a German doctor amputated his right leg. Bauer spent his time as a prisoner of war first in the Lubyanka prison in Moscow, then in the camps near Stalinogorsk, Krasnogorsk, Borovichi, and Wojkovo. On May 31, 1950, a Moscow court sentenced him to 25 years in a labor and correction camp. He was released early in October 1955 and returned to Germany. This made Bauer one of the late returnees. On February 17, 1993, Hans Bauer died at the age of 95 and was buried in the Westfriedhof Cemetery in Munich. <laughs>